Welcome to another interview of Israel Tech. I'm excited to have here Yaniv Shore, the founder and CEO of Progeo. Thank you for having us. Thank you for being here. So first thing I just want to say, we're in Kfar Saba. This is our first interview ever in Kfar Saba. I get out of the train and it's absolutely gorgeous. What a beautiful area. I don't know why more people don't have offices here instead of Tel Aviv. There's just so much green. Yeah. And things are you know, so well kept less, and clean. Less and all traffic. That. And less traffic. And uh, you can do everything here. Like if you need to buy something to your house, if you need uh-huh. something, you know, communication, PCs. Right. You have everything here. You yeah, can even great... fix your car. Well, they, oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you're talking about all these different errands that people do. And a big component of that is project management, which is hence named Progeo. Mm-hmm. Um, so project management. Why is this important? Aren't there enough management tools? I remember learning in business school about all the different management systems, Gantz, et cetera. And then we know that you hate Gantz. You got a, you got a little uh, poster over there. Um, w- what is it? W- why is it so important? How do, why does it keep changing? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a very good uh, question. This is mainly because not all the work is like ongoing work. You know, there is always work that is related to a specific delivery date, a specific case-by-case need for a customer. And then you need to assign uh, resources for that. You need to define a scope. You need to define the QA criteria. And this is a project at the end of the day. Um, Of course, in a factory, if you keep like manufacturing the same thing again and again, it's not a project. But if you need to move the factory from one location to the other, this is a project. So how does one know how to do that? Wouldn't, don't they usually usually go to a consultant who's let's say, or company that does moving all the time, helps move warehouses or things and, wouldn't they just go to them and they you know, would take care of the whole thing? I think wouldn't that, bringing in a new solution and a new technology make things more complicated? Yeah, I think that most of the people are learning that uh, as part of the university, like they're doing some basic stuff of how to arrange a work in a way that it will be a project at the end of the day. And then the rest is probably based on experience. When you are you know, entering a new company, they have a lot of knowledge about the things that they do. And you're lending with time how to run this specific uh, company project. And then you're getting to uh, the point where you need some tools. And this is where we, uh, you know, coming up with uh, like vendors. But every project is so different. Yeah. If it's not different, it's not a project. You know, if it's like a repeatable thing. Okay, right, I get that. So how does right. your how does your technology able to help people that have unique projects when they're so vastly different? How can you can say we can help you if you're trying to go to Mars or you're trying to move your warehouse? So it's always, uh, it always starts with a planning phase. You know, in the planning phase, you will make a decision. So what are the people that are going to work with me on that project? What will be the work streams that will be part of this uh, project? And then you come up with a plan. Then you have something you can share with people, you can track. And this is your, uh, usually your starting point. Do you think Gantt charts are dead? I don't know if I should admit this to you. For our SEO projects, we use a Gantt. Mm-hmm. Why shouldn't I? I don't think that Gantt charts are dead. You know, they are with us for, I don't know, a hundred uh, and something years. And I was using Gantt charts personally when I started my career as a project manager. And you can, you can plan with that. I think that the world is changing. Now you need to collaborate over a timeline. Now you need to present to management in a different way. Uh, the focus on resource management is significantly higher than it was before. And this is why you need more than a Gantt chart. It's not like it's dead. It's just an old technology that can be replaced now with new technology. So what, tell, what is this new technology? Like, you, the new technology is, you know, when I was a, a project manager and I was doing that for maybe uh, 20 years. When? When were you project manager? Um, you know, I was working for companies like 20 years, Intel. how old are you? Yeah, uh, 120. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 52. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I had like 20 years of project management experience before starting my, my first company. So I'm not a serial entrepreneur. I really grow from being part of uh, big American corporates like Intel and uh, Flextronics and, and, and Veriphone. And I was seeing the issues uh, firsthand. So this is where I started thinking about the need to have something that is actually different. Because I was seeing people managing projects. But they used to do it without uh, tools. They used to do it through project meetings. And I didn't see a tool that is really helping with the day-to-day of a project manager. You know, Gunshot, that you mentioned earlier, can help with the planning process but not with the day-to-day challenges of project manager. Okay, so I mean, but what goes from the tools we're using aren't perfect, which I think every professional in every field feels Mm like to let me go and build one. What's up with that? Because you're not an entrepreneur before this, right? This is the first company you found. Yeah, Yeah, that's right. But I was a project manager myself. 
Right. And over time, I was seeing that I'm not really using all these solutions that are out there. You know, I'm using Gunshot to planning, but then when I'm getting to the project status meeting, I'm not really using that. Then I always come up with something like a PowerPoint slide or even a sketch over a whiteboard. And I was trying to explain people what they're seeing on a whiteboard. It was, you know, many times was successful because the whiteboard can be quite uh, clear and people find it relevant to their work. But then at the end of the meeting, what can you do with a, with a whiteboard? You can take a picture of the whiteboard and then you can send it as attachment to people. And I started thinking, you know, this was back like 2015, 2016. Is that the best way to uh, manage project? Like to send whiteboard pictures into someone's email? And I started thinking that it should be an electronic way to do that. And originally I thought that there are probably ways to do it. And I started looking for tools like that. When and you when, start when looking, I for, didn't you find looking for tools for yourself. Yes. And I, I didn't find any tool that is actually doing that. And then I decided, oh, I'll try to do it myself. And then I was exposed to uh, the complexity of doing that. And I started thinking, oh, it's not as simple as I think. And then you gave up. And no. <laughs> <laughs> and then I started thinking about interesting idea in doing that. I wrote a book that is behind you, like uh, documenting some of the ideas I have in 2015. Time to deliver. Yes. Uh, then I authored two patents to protect some of the things that are in the book. Then we started an application. What are the patents on? Um, the patents are about the data structure that behind the plans that we're using today and about the visuals, uh, the UI that we finally designed in order to uh, show the project plan. Because the data structure we're using is not similar to the one that is behind the gunshot. And it has all kind of what we called before machine learning but now people are calling it AI that helps you analyze the project through the way the data set is built. So you, you see the problem. You wrote the book before, the, before you founded the company. Yes. And then what made you decide, okay, I'm now going to go try and solve something? So, so you know, I started to uh, write a book um, without thinking about a company. I was trying to just articulate the ideas I had in the space. Why write then, a book? Why not write a blog or something? Um, you know, just paper. because I uh, thought that it may be an interesting way to do it. By the way, the book is not like a, a, a guide. It, it's a novel. It's a story about a project manager. And oh. I, was, I was trying to you deliver know the, the, the message. The book, The Goal? Yeah. Uh, Elio. Exactly. This was maybe... What was his uh, last name? Elio. Uh, Goldratt. Gold, Gold he, was, right. he did that in the 80s. Maybe you want to talk about it? I read that in my, in my business school at bar -Lan University. Yeah, right. You know, he's a genius. He's, a, he's really... A, number one in the space, at least used to be uh, back in the 80s. But definitely this book was uh, maybe uh, an idea for me, you know, something I'd like to follow. Yeah. So I started to come up with something very that will be very different, but will tell, you know, um, tell approach through a story. Um, I tried to do that and uh, it took me like maybe four months because mm -hmm. it was not that easy. And as part of doing that, I started to realize that I have something that is maybe more than uh, a story. And this was the point where I started showing it to people. This is, by the way, my recommendation to anyone that has like good idea and want, you know, want to think about doing something with that. Start showing it to people so you see if it has some traction. If it has some traction, maybe it's a good idea. It should have very strong traction in order to finally be a startup in, in a company. But I started doing that and people started saying, you know, that's, that's interesting. Maybe you should do something with that. And over time, the idea is stronger than you. Oh, yeah, now you need to do that because you're not going to let someone else do it for you, right? This was a starting point. Uh, make that, a, make that a, I think, a clip, by the way, for the, for the Elio Gold. Uh, gold uh, Rod. Gold Rod. Sorry, for the goal. It's a, it's a great book. Okay. It's on. Okay, cool. Continuing. So what made you jump into the pool of entrepreneurship? Did you have other friends that were entrepreneurs? Were people encouraging you to? Were you like uh, spending too much time at home? <laughs> <laughs> All of them. No, I think that uh, it was mainly the fact that I was entrepreneur from day one. At the beginning, I did it inside some of the companies I was working for. So it was always uh, there. But the real thing uh, that maybe be uh, like starting my own company was a good idea. I think when you have a good idea, it's an easier decision to make because you see that it has some potential and, uh, and, and then you go for it. Without a very good idea, it's very hard to make a decision to live like the comfortable corporate life and be uh, an entrepreneur, which is not very comfortable. Right. No, it's, it's definitely not. 
So let's talk about Progio now, and then maybe we'll go back and look to your career. Mm-hmm. Um, how many people are you? What exactly are you? T- tell us, like, wh- what exactly, who are you solving? Who are your, who are your clients? What are you uh, changing? Obviously, we're improving project management. Okay. Could be yeah. sexier. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe you can pitch <laughs> it that way. But, like, how can people see the, understand the changes to businesses and maybe even to individuals or society? What, what is exactly, what kind of part do you guys play? So, so uh, to answer your first question, so today we are, we are a global company. We're spread between this side of the globe in Israel and uh, the US. Uh, from Israel, we're handling most of the R&D product side and also Europe. Um, and uh, in the US, we're managing the US market and this includes everything that you need there from sales to pre-sales to post-sales to marketing and even some development resources. So everything that we need uh, to do in the US is in the US and the company is like uh, today, like 50-50 between uh, the two locations. The, the, the thing that we are doing for our customer, I would divide it into three uh, major areas. The first one is process and pipeline management for projects. People are not considered for senior that very important, but think about that. If you have 100 projects, you first need to establish like a big matrix of information about the project. You know, is it in that region or the other region? What is the you know, potential revenue? Uh, it, was it justified? What are the business drivers that are behind it? And it's all about the project. You didn't start yet building tasks into that. You're not thinking about resource management. You're not just trying to justify another project or go after a project that you already justified before and that part of the execution list. So number one will be uh, an ability to manage the project as an object inside a pipeline, similar to the way you're doing for CRM and a deal. Okay. Number two will be resource management. Once you make a decision, do you have enough labor, enough budget, enough time, enough, uh, you know, if, if too many things are running in parallel, so you need to look at resources to make sure you can do it. This is number one. Number three is the execution. So now you need to plan the project, track it, share it with people in a clear way. So I think that these three pillars, process management, resource management, and execution, this is what finally makes project portfolio management a thing. And it's very different from, for example, work management or productivity tools or Zoom-like uh, applications that are really handling that today and tomorrow and next week and make it better for the team. I think that we are trying to make it better for the company, for the enterprise, to the management team. This is a very big difference between the So between segments. the process management, resource management, and um, execution, mm-hmm. um, what, is, what do you solve the most or what do you find in general is the hardest when it comes to I think that, you know, execution is quite trivial. If you have a timeline and you need to manage it some way, you need to find a way to, uh, you know, manage it correctly. And this is what we call seamless execution. Uh, I think that resource management is relevant for the bigger companies. If you have more than, and you don't don't need to be too big, like 200 employees or more, 500 employees or more. You have enough resources and then you have your bottlenecks and then you think about what resources will be added next year. And this is what you need resource management. I think that process management starts where you have a, a portfolio. Like if you have 15, 20, 50, sometimes 250 projects that are about to be executed, or maybe half are being executed and half is still in the intake process, you must have a way to manage that as a process with workflows, with justification forms, with approvals and, and all kinds of stuff. You're a first time founder. And you, in the army, you didn't necessarily do anything. The stereotypical places where a lot of entrepreneurs come out. Yeah, I'm not an 8200. Right, yeah. so you're on that or you're 81. So where do you exactly are? So how did you get here? What did, is there anything you did in the army that helped you get? What, what what part of your career led to someone to just project management? I'm not trying to dismiss it, but to go ahead and and build a successful startup. So I think that in Israel, entrepreneurship is everywhere. You mm-hmm. know, it starts from school even. Right. You know, people are talking with you about that. Uh, you're hearing about that in the news. You're getting, you know, all these exits that people are talking about. And then, of course, when you're going to the army, you're being, you continue being encouraged to do that. And uh, even your family, you know, the, the Jewish mother is pushing you in this direction. Right. And then, um, you know, when you start, even if you're part of a big company, there are always discussions about how we are doing entrepreneurship inside a company. For example, when I was part of Intel for six or eight years, uh, there were many projects and initiatives in that space, like, uh, you know, doing a startup inside a corporate. 
So this was the language you know, all along. I think that when I uh, um, continue and finally made my executive MBA as part of the Israeli uh, Technion, this was very focused on uh, entrepreneurship and about building new companies and about thinking about new ideas. And once you start think, um, you know, along that lines, you start, you, you start seeing all these gaps in reality. I'll give you just a very simple example. Uh, when I'm going out of my home in the morning in Shoham, I see many cars that are just parking across the street. And I started thinking, you know, these cars are not moving all day. So what can I do in order to mm -hmm. uh, help people use their cars better? So maybe we can open a network and then if I need a car and this car is not moving, maybe I can open an application and ask <laughs> someone to... So if, you're, if you start looking at the reality with this kind of lens or eyes, then you start to see all these opportunities to open a startup. And I think that it happened to me over the years, being part of the bigger companies, being part of uh, an MBA team that was focused on that. And I started seeing that there is this gap in project management that continue growing. Um, you know, the more the modern work environment is departing from the gun charts of uh, the previous century, the more gaps you're seeing. You don't have a way to present to your management you don't have a way to share information to a, a project team, a project status meeting. You don't have a way to collaborate over a timeline. And all these gaps I fin finally led to me thinking, okay, we need to maybe come up with something that can close the gap. The cut with him talking about the entrepreneurship, the Jewish mother thing, you think that be, I think that'd be a good short. Yeah. So you'd see these problems. You see these issues, all oh, the cars, and mm -hmm. you just start to think like that. You're seeing it from people around you. Basically, you're saying, the culture and society has made you think yeah. like an entrepreneur. Right. I think that th this is very right. And, uh, you know, when, do when you're doing your first step, I think that also kick in is the type of, you know, the Israeli society, which is very close. And uh, if you're an entrepreneur at the very early stages and you need help with something, it, it was amazing to uh, find out that you can just call someone that you don't even know. And you're asking the person, like, carefully, can you really, can you help me maybe... Um, I think I need one hour about uh, marketing channels. Can you can you help me with that? Uh, and the other side is saying, "Oh, are you available this afternoon? Or like, are you available tomorrow?" Right. Because well, this is the type of uh, relationship that are currently exists in the Israeli ecosystem, and people are really open to help other people. And of course, they know that it will uh, be a, an opportunity for them down the road if they need something. Uh, and I think that it is it makes it easier to um, build and start a startup in Israel. And this is maybe what created uh, the ecosystem that we're seeing here today with all these startups coming, uh, you know, being built um, again and again uh, in Israel. Yeah, people don't understand how important the speed is as in Israel. So yesterday morning, I was speaking to a man in Sydney, a cybersecurity marketer. And he, what happened, he invited me to follow his company's page. And I messaged him, do you want like, to talk to our market? He's like, sure. So now, like, great, what's your email? I took it to email. It was already scheduled. This was from Sunday to Monday, right? He's seven to eight hours ahead, seven hours ahead um, in Sydney. And then we get on the call, 9.30 a.m. Israel time. And he goes, you guys move fast. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what am I supposed to wait for? I was yeah. like, I don't like, he, and he, he's an immigrant from Singapore to Australia. And he goes, Australians are just way too chill and lazy. These are his words. Mm -hmm. That by the time they get to it, they would have sent the invite four days later, and then maybe an email. Doesn't that like just make it? it just it's the not speed, like that. You the know, speed it, it, that we move here is at least in tech. Unfortunately, I think we have a lot of um, special interests and regulations and other issues in Israel that before the tech industry. Um, but things just move so fast, and it's so unique. I don't think we get anywhere else. Yeah, I think it's you know it's it makes it more dynamic and. Um, it also reduces the, the barrier for entry. Because if you have access to other people and you know that they will respond, right. then it must, makes it easier for you to- uh, You feel to more the, comfortable reaching out. Step. Yeah. Right, as you opposed know, to, can you, you know introduce that you can, me? You know that you can do that. that. Right, you can just go ahead and yeah. do it. It's amazing the response like that. And then I, I take that culture to America and people think I'm obnoxious. They probably think I'm like that here too, but even more so in America. So the Technion, right, the executive MBA, you went, and did they encourage entrepreneurship? Because usually the I, point of school um, is to make you 
who not think, <laughs> in my opinion, right? You know, I would even, I'm not going to use the word encourage because they did significantly more than that. You know, the entire, it was two and a half years. And from the very beginning, it was clear that they are trying to push you in that direction. In like which if, direction? In, in direction of building something your own. Of like entrepreneurship. Your company. Yeah. Do was, wait, no, the executive MBA that you did. Yes. Was the goal of that? Because if you were to take an executive MBA at a university in America, God forbid, don't go to any university <laughs> in America. Um, but if you were to go to any of these evil institutions, they would push you to, uh, they, they don't teach, push entrepreneurship. They push you how to yeah. how to get a, at the big corporate like a like Forbes two hundred. Basically, citizen, like yeah. wouldn't be surprised half of their have their classes might be on like uh, corporate politics. Probably wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, yeah. It, it, why is it so different at the Technion? Is it all Technion? Is it just your executive MBA? I, Maybe I think that yeah. I think it's the executive MBA, um, and uh, even they're trying to differentiate themselves. So they even titled that like uh, new technology company, something like that. And uh, from the very beginning, they're talking about how you, how can you build a business plan, how you identify a good idea. Uh, there are many, um, you know, meet the industry kind of uh, discussions. We have entrepreneurs coming in. Uh, some of them are serial entrepreneurs and are trying to help you, like, think about it, like, think about the first phase of uh, starting a company. So I think that they're not encouraging you. They're really pushing you strongly in order to go in that direction. And the last, uh, you know, the, the management game at the end of uh, the executive MBA is about starting a company. So I think that they are really trying to do that. And I think that they're doing it successfully because over the years, there are so many, um, you know, executive MBA uh, graduates that are really opening uh, startup companies. So I think that it works. You said the executive MBA was two and a half years, right? Yes. Did you, what made you decide to get an executive MBA? You know, I was already working for um, Verifone. Uh, mm -hmm. at that yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. And I started feeling that I'm missing some, um, you know, deeper and wider management knowledge. And since I, I was already an experienced manager myself, like with 10 or 12 years of experience, I was looking for something that will be a little more than just learning the basics. And I was looking at several executive You couldn't MBAs. find that in the private industry? Like maybe you were just at the wrong job at Verifone or the wrong position or something? No, you know, it's, not, it's not like uh, going out there and meet some other people and do all the networking. Just the thought of me that. going back to school sounds yeah. like really Which painful. Was, and it, you know, to be frank, it was, it was a complete fun. I really enjoyed every minute of that. Like relearning some of the things I'm you know, familiar with, but you can always go one level, one layer deeper. And uh, really going through the more advanced courses of how to build a business plan. And I, I really enjoy that. And I think that it was a great uh, decision. And I also encourage people that are, you know, some people are doing it right after the first degree that they will do their MBA. I think it's not always the right thing to do because if you have some experience going through the MBA process, then you can learn more. By the way, I agree, but people do it because it's a bullshit piece of paper. So they yeah. try to get it over with. Because you know, I did that, well, I graduated, I studied finance. And I graduated December 2008, so in the middle mm -hmm. of the year. And there were just, uh, there was a huge financial collapse a few months earlier. Mm -hmm. And Obama was just elected who said he'll overregulate the banks and there were no jobs. So, I mean, I came to Israel and I waited like 10 months later, I started my MBA. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I was wondering, like, for me, it was just like, okay, it seems like bureaucratic. That's why people do it. Yeah. But doesn't that imply people don't really learn much in their bachelor's? No, I think that the general? executive MBAs are built differently. You know, I started, started the executive MBA at the age of uh, 36. So, and, and people with me in the room, but all, were, were also like between, I don't know, uh, 34 to 40. So a lot of experience even in the room. Right. And you can learn a lot from that. And I think that this is That's maybe why it's more valuable. So after you, you, did you already have in mind that you were gonna build Progeo while you're at the MBA or how did you transition from that into entrepreneurship? So I, I think I, I had the original idea in mind, but it took me uh, several additional years before I felt that this is like uh, mature enough and I can do something with that. So not exactly after that, but maybe uh, three or four years after. Uh, that's a while. So what did you do during those three years? You know, I continued, just continued working as a PMO director. Right. Got and it. Uh, I let the idea like, uh, you know, I, I build more information into the idea. I wrote a book, as I, I mentioned, right. and then started. The well, the book in of itself is an, an entrepreneurial endeavor in a sense. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not. You know, it's just a way to articulate the idea because if if you're done, I mean, writing you know, a book, if you're I mean, doing you something great, let's say you're doing something really great, but then I'll ask you to 
uh, build a pattern into that. Like how exactly you're doing that? Like in a way that someone else can read your book and do the same thing. Then you will have to invest some thinking process in that. Like how can I do that? Like what are the one, two, three, four, five things that I'm doing in order to approach a project meeting correctly? So this is the process I went through. Awesome. So starting the company, do you have co-founders? Yeah, I have a, a co-founder, Barak Shibi, that was working with me in Verifone. He was a highly experienced uh, R&D manager, and uh, he uh, started the company with me as a, as a CTO. So from the beginning, we uh, started like, uh, you know, he was responsible for all the technology part, uh, putting together the platform and everything around that. And I was responsible for more the business side and to build uh, the business case around it and to find the first investor and, and so forth. And then, okay, so how did you find the first investor? So the two of you, like, how did, what did you come to? What did you bring to so, investors? So, you know, as, as always, it's a kind of a coincidence. We started thinking about the idea, and then I had uh, to meet someone that maybe will be joining us as part of the founding team. Was this while you were still Verifone, like you're doing this on the side? Or uh, are you you know, I was, always, I was already, like, in, a, in my last uh, months with Verifone. And, um, you know, I was talking to someone that I thought will be part of the founding team. And then he said, you know, I can't do that because I already started working with an investor. And so, oh, that's interesting. Let me let me to an investor. And this investor happened to be a CEO of the company. And he was using one of our competitors tool and he was not very happy. And he's seeing our idea, you know, back then it was like uh, maybe four slides, a PowerPoint with nothing in it, but he was smart enough to to say, oh, there's, there's something here. And he made uh, like the, you know, the initial seed investment and this is how we started. And, and after that, of course, there was a follow-up investment and, and uh, some uh, involvement of additional partners so we can really do something with that. But I think that this was the, the, the first uh, thing. It happened like in 2017. So, what did, so you got the, f how much was the funding your first round? You know, several hundreds, uh, re really just, low. Just to yeah, test it. Yeah, just, just to, I think the beginning, the seed money, is used in order to check that there is really something in it. Like you're building the very initial visuals, you're, you're checking the technology just to make sure you're not shooting in the wrong direction. And once you are over that and uh, you're, you're getting to your first achievement, this is where you can maybe get more seed money or post seed money to really come up with a solution. Because our solution at the end of the day, it's an enterprise solution. And you're not uh, coming up with an enterprise solution in, in two months. You need to spend two years on that. There are so many features, so many modules that are part of an enterprise solution. So it took us between 2017 to, I would say, 2019 to say that we have a product that is really good enough for enterprises. And through this process, yeah, we work with seed money, later on with post-seed money from one of Capital Partners. And, uh, and then we got to the point where we can really offer an enterprise solution. What was the hardest part of bringing your product like out there? Was it didn't have enough money, didn't have the right partners, getting enough people buying in or trying your product? To use this, the case like what, what was the hardest? Uh, part I of think you know you can ground? you can uh, have people trying your product if you provide it for free and if you're using correctly uh, you know these uh, circles of uh, the three F like uh, family friends fools. Right. Then fools. you can get some initial <laughs> <laughs> you can get some initial feedback. To the product, it's not it's not the biggest issue. I think that the big the big issue at the beginning is that you don't have enough resources in order to make mistakes. Right. You know, and you need to really think. You know, you have one shot on selecting your development team. You have one shot of selecting a direction on the product level. And if you miss that, you're not going to have another opportunity. So I think this is very challenging, and you really need to be to carefully put your ego aside and to really make decisions that are based on the data that you are seeing and to base on things that you believe will work in the market and listen to your customers if you already have customers so you can really go through this very hard initial phase. So let's talk about the fundraising a little bit. So you got, you found a, a family, a friend, or a fool to help you with the first several hundred thousand <laughs> jokes aside, right? And then you start kind of building something. That they saw you were on this thing, you were able to solve some kind of a problem. Uh, at what point did you, how much of the product was prepared or, or developed before you went to ask for more funding? Uh, I think um, that uh, it was not really a product back then. It was more of a proof of concept. I think any uh, startup company, and we can talk about that in more details uh, later today, 
will go through this process of doing the proof of concept. Like it's not only an idea, it's something that I can really um, do something with and um, you know, customers are positively reacting to that. Mm -hmm. So this is the proof of concept. Then you have the product market fit and then you have your go-to-market. These are the three phases that you need to go through if you like to build something like that. So I think that we were completing the proof of concept. Uh, it looks good enough. Uh, there are positive, uh, positive feedback from customers. Some of them are already using that. And this allows for the next um, like funding round. Awesome. So, and then how did you find them? Who introduced you? How did that work? Um, you know, again, because of the ecos ecosystem in Israel, which is very large, there are many different uh, investors you can approach. Of course, you need to do your homework and... Uh, well, wait, 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 I want to stop you there. When you say there's a lot of the ecosystem in Israel, there's a lot of investors you can approach. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you mean just approach them? You email them and they'll they'll take a, they'll take a meeting or... Yeah, what, you can, what do you mean you by can, approach? Because I think most people, at least not in Israel, when they're just going to approach a VC, they're just going to ignore you. What yeah. do you mean? So, so uh, first of all, VCs are not always ignoring you because VCs, you know, they also need to develop their pipeline. And if you approach correctly, then they will say, oh, that's interesting enough. Let, let's talk to a guy. But uh, you're right that uh, the best approach will be with a reference. And here, is, you know, again, the Israeli network is very strong in that. Right. Like if you, if you like to approach uh, one of the early stage, uh, uh, you know, VCs, like let's say uh, Aleph, like an right. example, then you can find someone that knows someone and can introduce you in a more, in a less cold, cold right. way. And uh, this is many times the right way to do that. But uh, at the end of the day, it's not about, um, you know, the personal connection at the beginning. It's about, is it a good idea or not? Yeah, in order for you to be good, it should be part of a trend. You know, for example, if you do something in AI today, of course, it's more interesting. It should be differentiated correctly, not something that was, you know, is out there already. And, you know, investors, uh, they know that. And it should be also the right timing because you need to introduce something that, uh, had an opportunity to be successful now, and you need to explain why now is the right thing to do that. Like, for example, if I'm looking at uh, Projo, the need for timelines that are not traditional gun chart was out there. This, this, is, this, this was the answer uh, when people ask me, so why now? Because now people are, they had enough from gun charts and look, they're looking for something else. This is why I can be successful. So I think that um, these are the parameters you need to follow if you like, um, you know, a, a seed stage VC to uh, to respond to your message. Interesting. And then so from there, you've grown and you have revenue and customers and clients, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what is the hardest part about getting through cash flow positivity? Um, to, to cash flow positivity? Yeah. I think that the beginning, it's not really your target. You're not trying to get to cash flow positivity from day one. And um, if you go back like four, five years ago, it was not even a target, even at the later stages. It was even a red flag for VCs. Like if you are cash positive, maybe it's because your idea is not strong enough and you're trying to like be a balanced company and just continue. Um, but I think that recently um, COVID-19 uh, crisis, then the crisis in Europe, the inflation in the US, I think that profitability became more important and even VCs, they know how to appreciate that um, these days. Uh, I think that you need to time it correctly, uh, look at uh, the funds that you have and make sure that you can grow enough because when you're growing, you're not profitable, but then get to profitability or at least have a long-term plan to profitability in order to, uh, to get there. Uh, potentially, uh, uh, an investor will come like in between saying, you know, I'm not interested in that. Go ahead, continue your growth process. I, I'm not interested in profitability. That's a possibility. But generally speaking, build a company into profitability. It's a good idea these days. Yeah, and you say these days because it wasn't the case just a few years ago. Yeah, not 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 a case, and was even it was counterproductive before. What does that like, explain? What you just said. You're saying profitability was counterproductive to raising money. Right. A few years ago, let's say before the recent inflation recession. Can because, you, you know, uh, investors, they uh, um, they uh, were thinking along the lines of if I'm uh, investing in a company and I'm giving you enough money, I'd like to see you growing aggressively, like 
two times a year, three times a year. And mm -hmm. then I trust that the next investor will continue fund a company and you can continue this growth uh, path. Mm -hmm. And this was, you know, it works, especially when the market is, is really high yeah. and strong, it works. But when you have um, years like 2022, 2023, like find, funding resources was not available, then these companies that are really growing fast and then they must find the next investor are having difficulties. While if you are closer to profitability with relatively low amount of money, you can continue your process. And I think, I think that this is why it became more relevant. It reminds me of investing in real estate. It's uh, when you invest for appreciation, not cash flow, is that you make your profit based on when you acquired the real mm -hmm. estate, not more than, it's yeah. more important than when you and, sell. You know, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that this model is completely not relevant. Like, right. Uh, you know, but it's I think that. Right. The, there is more uh, appreciation but what, why to the other model. Looking for, why aren't, aren't, I understand VCs may, let's say everyone's tightening their belt and they may be looking for more safer prof, smaller profitable opportunities. Maybe they'll take more, less risk, let's say. But aren't there still great opportunities or are companies still being able, you can get in early and all that? Have they? Yeah, you know, there are. They, are they still focused on it as much at all or? Yeah, no, no, there are opportunities. Uh, again, I don't, I'm not saying that it's completely not relevant anymore to grow faster. Of course, it's a great thing. And this is, uh, you know, are still very uh, appreciative of that. Uh, but there are other financial bodies in the market, like private equities right. and other investors that uh, are looking also for right. profitability. Right. So I think that it's not like moving from one to the other, but I think that there is a trend and uh, people are looking more on profitability these days. And you've raised how much so far? We raised about uh, 14 million, almost nice. 14 million, most of it in, a, in an A round nice, that yeah. we did at the end of uh, 2021 with, with, with about $8 million. It was announced uh, publicly. And before that, it was like seed money, some um, Israel Innovation Authority uh, money. Oh, cool. We'll be interviewing them number. Um, yeah. in another two months. Yeah. Do you worry that, like, you know, with so much uncertainty in the world, not to mention war, inflation, politics, uh, economics, trade, that like you're ever going to like do you have any kind of anxiety that you're not going to be able to get to cash flow positivity i feel that i'm feeling a lot of anxiety in general from other founders and things like that that you know things are so dramatically changed that there's the more uncertainty might provide more anxiety are so, you, you know, do you feel my, that yourself my job as a ceo is to be concerned okay this is my go. job so if i'll yeah. tell you i'm not concerned about something then something went wrong right of course i'm concerned and uh, uh you know the need to strategically plan for Profitability in our case, or strategic plan for growth and for hiring, is always out there. Um, in, in our case, we're really doing it longer term. Like uh, you know, I think that we are following a strategy since the beginning of 2022, and we're still executing on that uh, strategy. Having said that, uh, yeah, there is a, a very significant concern in the market for the smaller company like the startups because yeah, 2022, 2023 they were hard, but it looks like 2024 is also um, you know, another hard year because we're not seeing the recovery yet in the market, not seeing the recovery yet, you know, with VCs and, and private equities. So probably it's 2025. And this is a lot yeah, of time to go through. Probably 2026. Like, yeah. So this is one concern. I think that the other concern um, is really the new technology. You know, AI technology is really a threat today to many industries and domains. You know, if, uh, if uh, AI technology gets to... Uh, I don't know, CRM, maybe it can kill some of the CRM ideas that are out there and, and people are paying for that for, for a long time. I think that uh, that concern, specifically in the project management space, it's an opportunity, another concern, because it's not uh, likely with the existing technology that AI-based system will start managing projects for organizations, it require too much uh, people management, face-to-face -face interactions, and it's not really possible to do it only with a machine. But at the same time, there are great opportunities in that space, especially for a company like us, because we have a patent in the space and we know how to analyze information in a way that enable AI. Uh, there are great opportunities to use the technology. You know, everyone are familiar with that chat GPT, NLP technology. So this is one, but also generative AI can be uh, used and many ideas that can make the project management uh, uh, life and day-to-day -day easier, a great opportunity for us. But uh, generally, it's still a threat. You know, AI technology, 
is the new thing that people need to look at and, and plan accordingly. And so where do you see uh, Progeo and you and what you're doing differently in the next year or two? Or do you see Israeli tech changing in the near future? Uh, I think that if we go back to AI, this is a major part of our focus. Uh, this year, and of course, will be also uh, next year, uh, embedding uh, this technology in our solution in a way that it helps users uh, to do the work faster and to get, uh, you know, to get access to data, to data uh, faster. And I think that other than that, if I'm looking forward, it's, it's also uh, uh, integrations. You need to know how to work inside the enterprise ecosystem and to connect to other, uh, other system in enterprise, either natively through your app or with the open API. But this is definitely a, a must. The more uh, tools you have out there, the more f flexibility and, and dynamic you have out there. This is also something we're looking at uh, for 24 and 25. Awesome. Yaniv Shore. Thank you so much, founder and CEO of Progeo. We'll put everywhere to follow you and Progeo down in the description. Uh, thank you so much for being on Israel Tech. Thanks for Thank now. you very much.